should be getting that now. And Kelly, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. And I just want to thank um, TELSIG and um, the Social, Ju Social Justice SIG for um, uh, organizing the, this joint event. I'm, I'm really happy to be able to do it uh, for both and I've been really looking forward to it. Um, so I'll get straight into it. So how much time we're gonna have? Okay, so um, overall, there's kind of three parts to this. The first part is probably gonna be the longest. I was gonna try and fit it into 20 minutes, but that's probably not gonna happen. I'll try not to talk too fast to fit it all in and make it more, because that's the kind of the important bit. It's kind of the justification for what um, I'm doing. Um, and that's about um, uh, students using AI for language adjustment. And I use the term adjustment rather than correction quite um, uh, consciously, specifically for reasons that will become clear as I talk about it. Um, and then the second part, and the second part will be about um, students using AI for language learning. Um, and this part will be more sort of practical examples about what I've done in class and how I've incorporated um, AI into my classes and the, um, not only AI, but also the translanguaging and um, linguistic justice. And uh, I've also got down there an interactive task. I'm not sure how much time we'll have for that. I may skip that if, because I think the questions and discussion might be more valuable than doing that. So we'll see how much time we've got. So uh, first, just a bit of a note on terminology, because I know the term AI kind of gets thrown around meaning different things. I'll probably refer to, um, maybe AI, but digital language tools. And I think of them as a spectrum of lots of different things. So anything from like word spell check to Grammarly to machine translation to generative AI. So if I'm specifically talking about generative AI, that is what I will say. Um, and so my first point is that students using AI for language adjustment is justified. And that's because academic English is not necessary for academic purposes. Um, and I'm going to give some examples for that. Um, it acts as exclusionary gatekeeping and it makes academia less accessible on the whole to sort of, you know, a lot of people. Um, so academic English is a linguistic barrier. Um, I've heard this quote that no one is a native speaker as of academic English. You know, everyone has to learn academic English. No one learns it for, as a child. But it is more similar to some people's English or some people's languages than others. So um, people can be, you know, further away from it and it's easier for some people to learn than others and more accessible. Please, what's going on? Um, there is um, some research, a uh, recent study there showing, looking at um, uh, people publish second language English speakers publishing and they're less likely to be able to publish if they're non-native speakers. And also a more recent study looking at the more different the language is from academic English um, the more um, issues there were with academia, uh, access to academia. And so that study showed that sort of Dutch um, speakers were more likely to be publishing than, say, French speakers. So it, it does act as a barrier. It has been um, referred to as, in this paper by Warshaw et al., as a tax. So um, uh, non-native English speakers have to work harder to read English, um, attending conferences, publishing, it's all harder uh, for them. And, and this paper by Megan Figueroa, she refers to it as a psychological paywall when she was talking about um, podcasting being a more accessible way of people accessing sort of academic um, linguistics. Um, so academic practice does happen in other um, uh, varieties of English. So it is possible to do academia in not just in academic English. And there are, it's rare, but there are some examples around. And here are sort of three examples in African-American English. You've got a uh, hip hop doctoral thesis by A.D. Carson. Um, there's an entire article here by Vashon Ashanti Young and also a abstract written in African-American English by Anne Hudley. Um, and uh, on the topic of abstracts, I keep seeing plain language summaries more and more in journals as I'm accessing them. And whenever I see them, I always think to myself, why not just write it like that in the first place? Um, but it's, you know, it's becoming more accessible, but these also show that you, know, you don't need academic English to be able to do academic practice. And I find this on social media more and more. So I follow a bunch of creators on TikTok who are doing academic things. They are using... Um, citations, explaining complex topics, and they're doing it in diverse ways and it's making it accessible. So I, I have a short one minute video here. I'm gonna play of three um, different creators. 
A new study published in the Nature Journal Digital Medicine shows how large language models like ChatGPT propagate debunked racist tropes and in general just race-based medicine. Silver nitrate has been known for a long time to have some kind of antimicrobial ability and it's because silver ions can attack proteins and just denature them. They can react with a whole bunch of different parts of the protein and just make the proteins not work. This isn't specific to bacteria necessarily, but a single celled organism is gonna have a harder time dealing with that than you or I, so, you know. Now, colloidal silver, as I said, is not the same thing as silver nitrate. Colloidal silver doesn't really work quite the same, if at all. And in fact, when you drink it, you're kind of just giving yourself heavy metals poisoning. All right, boom. Man's got some aluminium powder there, innit? This is made of the same thing as aluminium foil, but obviously it's just a powder thing and that, innit? Grey settings, you know what's going on. All right, so we're going to react it with some potassium hydroxide, innit? This is a flaky thing still, you get me? So, um, you can see the first two creators are using citations. They're, um, you know, doing academic things. The last one in particular, I want to point out Big Manny. I'm a big fan of his work. Um, the comment sections in his videos are always full, either, you know, of people criticizing his language, but also full, more importantly, I think, of people saying, oh, I wish you had have been my science teacher. I would have understood it. Um, the class is so much better. And it's just, it's kind of bittersweet seeing, you know, these people that, you know, uh, science and academia would have been more accessible to them if they had been taught in a way that was, you know, their language and they understood. A new study. Oh, there we go. Um, so, you know, we've got this issue with the deficit approaches with our students. So our students come to us not as blank slates. They have language. I keep, uh, you know, I hear this uh, calculator analogy uh, with uh, generative AI. You know, you still have to learn the basic things. Can't just rely on a calculator. But our students don't come to us without language. They come to us. They can still create ideas um, in their own languages. Um, and I really like this quote by Julia Molinari, who talks a lot about um, academic English and, and what, it, what it is. Um, and she says that <laughs> academic writing needs to be educative. And to be educative means creating the conditions for writers to be knowledgeable. And, you know, are we doing that? Are we making it um, easy for them to develop their ideas and their arguments? Or are we just more relying on um, them having to do it, do that practice through academic English, which makes it more difficult? And for me, it's an issue of accessibility. So our students are admitted to higher education at a disadvantage, just they're admitted on kind of IELTS 6 or 6.5. It's going to be harder to access for yeah. them. And allowing yeah, them yeah, to yeah, use yeah. AI for language adjustment decreases this disadvantage. And I'm going to show some examples about why that is. Um, I keep hearing people say things like um, writing is thinking, and that's why it's important. But I don't think, you know, that's probably true for a lot of people, but I don't think that's true for everyone. Um, it helps a lot of people think, but there's this um, a video here that I've linked to by um, Kelly Gibson. She's a secondary um, teacher in uh, the United States, and I don't have time to play it, but it's on the Padlet, and I suggest you go and watch it, because she gives this example of a student she's got who has great ideas, is really insightful, can verbally explain all the arguments they have, but when it comes to writing them down, they're almost unintelligible. There's just some kind of block there. And the student hasn't been diagnosed with anything. Maybe they haven't sought out the diagnosis, but diagnosis is not always accessible to everyone and it takes time. Um, and we have all taught neuro, neurodiverse students, whether we were aware of it or not, or even if the student was aware of it, just statistically, we definitely have. Um, so this benefits neurodiverse folk as well. Um, Amy Aisha Brown has a video, which I've linked there. Uh, she's at King's College London of how she uses um, uh, AI to help her write as a, a neurodiverse person. Um, I saw this tweet shortly after ChatGPT was released in 2022, like within a week or two, and it, it's always stuck with me. So this guy says he mentors a um, landscaper who has poor literacy school, skills, and it's hard for him to professionally communicate in writing with his clients. So this guy set up just a ChatGPT powered Gmail account where the guy could write the way he writes, and it would adjust his language to make it sound more professional. And also, um, and not only in writing, but accessibly in, in reading. Uh, this is some tweets I come across very recently of someone who says, oh, someone suggested I 
uh, ask ChatGPT to rewrite, uh, you know, the content I have to learn for for college as um, RuPaul with as much gay slang as possible. And, you know, it's got it rewritten down there, but all the quote tweets I could see of it were people going, oh, this is uh, so much easier to read. I'm going to do this for all my readings. I'm going to use this to learn my math. And then you've even got um, uh, a Spanish speaker thinking that it's helpful and a Portuguese speaker as well. So not only, you know, does the uh, does this rewriting make it easier for uh, um, maybe speakers of non-prestige English for uh, non-native speakers as well? And I think um, writing processes are going to change and they are changing for a lot of people. Writing is and it always has been technology. And as the tools change, human behavior is going to change with it. Again, it's that paper by Warshower, which I really recommend reading because it's a, it's a great paper. Um, digital assistance with writing now is ubiquitous. There's not many situations where I ever write now. I don't think there's any situations I write now that I don't have digital assistance. Um, and if there are, they're kind of really artificial, like exams for students. So, you know, if they have a need for it, then yes. But a lot of the time people use digital assistance. So for me, part of writing a proficiency is you being able to use that and use it well and critically. And writing can be multimodal now. Um, the tech advances have allowed this. So um, the event organizers don't know this, but when I was uh, writing the abstract for this submission for this webinar, I was thinking, oh, it's going to take me ages. I find academic English is a barrier for me. I can't phrase things. I can't get my ideas out when I try and do it in academic English the first time. So I thought, okay, I'm going to turn on ChatGPT. I'm going to use the voice function. And I said to it, I, you know, I want to do the submission. I need an abstract. I'm going to tell you all my ideas. Can you write it into and rewrite it into an abstract for me? And I did that. I spoke for about five or 10 minutes, maybe five minutes, um, got all my ideas out, not in a very structured way, but they were all my ideas, the things I'd been thinking about and reading about. And then it wrote this abstract and it did a pretty good job. I went back in and I edited it. So it was more my voice and whatever, but it took probably like a two hour job down to 10 minutes for me. And they were all my ideas. So for me, I feel like that's legitimate. I don't feel that's academic misconduct. Um, so the end result is you're communicating your ideas in a written way for a reader. Um, also, student use of academic of AI for language adjustment, I think, is natural part of translanguaging. And this is where the translanguaging comes into um, my ideas. Translanguaging um, is a concept that was developed in Wales in the 1990s by Ken Williams to do with the bilingual education here um, called Trasjefi in, in Welsh. I had to get some Welsh into the, into the um, webinar. Um, and it's essentially um, the idea that multilingual individuals use uh, their full linguistic repertoire in um, creating meaning and understanding and knowledge. Um, so in EAP, students, yeah, it's a good idea for them to be able to use their full linguistic repertoire for reasons I was talking about earlier, which is similar to AI. It reduces their cognitive barrier if they can use, uh, you know, the language that they've already got to start to develop their ideas, and then they can, compute it, can communicate it in English. Um, also, validating students um, L1 in the classroom is a good idea. It decenters English. Um, we talk about decolonizing the curriculum. Um, it gives them agency in their language use. We can give them, um, you know, let, let them decide what works for them. In the same way I was talking about writing processes are going to change, then, you know, we can let students maybe have some agency and choose how it works best for them. And then so um, the digital comes into this translanguaging. I first got this idea from a paper by Jo et al. Um, and they're only discussing machine translation. Um, but they view it from this perspective of the students are, you know, moving between their languages. They're doing it in a way that allows them to communicate, to develop their ideas and communicate their ideas. And um, I think now we've got Gen AI and that can function not only in the same way as machine translation does between different languages, but between different varieties of English. So, um, or different styles of English. So you can, our students can try and communicate in their emergent English and then have it rewritten to academic English, still their ideas that they're, that they're um, using. So uh, my view is that we could reconceptualize EAP and start to meet students where they're at. So students have been using machine translation. It's been ignored or banned for a long time. I think the tech has um, increased and developed to a point that like I said it's almost ubiquitous. Obviously, there are issues with um, accessibility to it, 
but uh, most people have access to some sort of free version and uh, internet at the universities. And they're going to use it whether we allow it or not. Um, the study I've linked there was a survey by Turnitin last October, who um, and one of their results was they asked students, would you keep using generative AI if it was banned? And 75% of them said yes. And I think it's the same as translanguaging. We can try and force students to use you know, only English in classrooms, but it's natural for them to move between their languages. Um, so our students are going to make meaning using all the tools they have, whether they're linguistic or whether they're technolo uh, um, uh, technological. They also find them useful for learning. Um, uh, I've uh, surveyed my students, um, different classes, and it's really amazing. It always, I've asked them, do you do these tools only adjust your language or are you also learning from them? And the result stays almost consistently at 80% them saying they learn from the tools as well. They also use them critically. They're, when I talk to them, they're almost always aware of the drawbacks. Um, they don't want them to overtake their English learning, uh, but you know they're better able to use them critically, I think, if they would have tutor guidance in using them. So I think we, you know, we can you give students some agency and some, some voice in how they are doing writing, how writing and how languaging works for them. Um, this quote here, the, the last one is from the UNESCO um, Generative AI Guidance, who do mention that it could be useful for, you know, minority um, linguistic cultural backgrounds um, in the in amplifying their voices. So my idea was instead of EAP and reconceptualizing this, my approach would be something more like digitally enabled translanguaging for academic purposes, if that's what the students are kind of doing. The end result we want them to communicate in is English because that's the context they're in. Um, but what they're doing uh, is more along these lines. And this is what I've tried to kind of find ways to implement. Obviously, there are going to be some problems. I'm not going to go too much into the criticisms. If we've got questions at the end, I'm happy to address them. But um, I try and keep more, you know, I'm I, I, I focusing mostly on the positives because I just don't see any discussion really online or uh, in many places about how this can make things fairer for our students. And I think our um, field is where it has the most effect and where it can have the most um, influence because it's language technology um, and our students, you know, language learners. Um, the biggest problem I see is it is just reinforcing linguistic conformity. So English dominance, if you're telling them to um, change their language to academic English, you're just reinforcing the use of academic English, obviously. Um, but I think those are kind of related, uh, but different issues. So the standards exist. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. Our students have to meet those standards. I think uh, for now, letting them meet those standards in a more fair way by using AI is a good way to go. Um, but I think also there needs to be top-down structural change in just accepting more linguistic diversity in academia. Um, my little approach to that, I feel like that's above my pay grade, but my little approach to that is to this term, I've changed all the content in my classes into critical language analysis. So my students have been working on um, is academic language fair? Do they have to learn it? What are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? You know, um, and uh, that's been going really well. Um, so the, obviously there are problems with um, generative AI being um, uh, uh, discriminating itself and its output. But I figure if we encourage our students to use non-English languages in formal contexts, then, uh, and, and everyone is encouraged to do that, Generative AI is so good at um, formal and standard English because that's what it's trained on, because that's what's available, because that's what exists in the formal context. So if there's more linguistic variety in formal context, it's going to have you know, more to train on. It'll be better at those languages. And I think I mentioned briefly the, the threat to EAP. I think this is a, a something we need to take on board and really think about. Um, English learning is just going to be less important with the development of the technology. If it was any other kind of content um, learning they were doing, I would think, yeah, people are still going to want to learn the information. But language learning is so time and effort intensive that, of course, if people want to take, you know, it takes years and years. Um, if people are going to take, find some shortcuts, they're going to use them. Um, academic publishers are implementing their own AI writing assistants. Springer Nature has one, and they've shown that increases, I think they tested it with Chinese um, academics, and it increased the rate of acceptance of their articles. Um, and I think also students are just going to be bored and disengaged if they're learning things they know AI can do, or if their writing processes have changed and we're not moving along with that. 
Um, so I was going to give an example here of um, students using uh, AI for language adjustment in class. Um, and so in this class, they just I asked them to write something on a topic we'd been discussing in their first language and then use machine translation, just Google Translate to translate it and then to rate the translation. So quite simple. And here's an example. So we've got one Chinese, one I think is Yoruba or Igbo, I think it's Yoruba, and one I think is Punjabi. Um, and so, yeah, so they've put their, the original on a Padlet, they put the translation and they've given it a rating. So that's an example of doing it. So I'm going to use this example because we, we went further with this um, task. But before I do, it kind of moves on now to the uh, using AI for language learning. So it's not to say that they can just adjust their language and that's it. You know, they've got an easy way out. Um, they can just you know, submit what they've, you know, come out of the, the AI. Um, they still need proficiency to be able to read that and evaluate it and make sure it says what they're intending to express their ideas. Um, so they still need skills. It's just the skills have shifted a little bit. Um, so, uh, and they can use uh, AI uh, to learn language as well. We can incorporate it into lessons in a way that makes it productive for them. And I've done this in a few ways. Um, there's a, a bunch of benefits of this. Independent learning, if they learn how to use the tools well, if they learn to evaluate the output and use it kind of as um, exemplars, it kind of gives them endless exemplars of standard and academic language, um, more engagement in class as soon as you bring up AI, everyone gets um, uh, really engaged with it in a positive way. Um, and digital literacy. Um, and also um, uh, critical skills as well, being able to critically evaluate the output. So here's my first example of students using it for language learning. I've put the learning outcomes on each of these, what I was intending them to do. So this one was just to notice the features of academic English. Like I said, it can be used as an exemplar. So that past one where I just said they used um, machine translation to translate their first language, they did that. Of course, it translates it then just into sort of general English, not academic English. It's still not what they're aiming for. So what I did, students could do this part, but I had done it. I took the, the English output from the machine translation, put it into chat GPT, and I asked it to rewrite it in academic English. And then I gave those to the students both. And so they could compare them like the, the general English and the academic English. And I asked them to look down and note down on a worksheet what they found, the differences in grammar, the difference in vocabulary and conciseness in meaning. Was the meaning still the same? And if there were any errors, um, this is what we got. Um, so for the it was really useful, I think, for them because they could see, you know, what, what's the vocabulary difference? Um, if there was a, it changed a word to some vocabulary they didn't understand, then I could be like, okay, so you should be looking that up to make sure that's a word that means what you intend it to mean. Um, looking for mistakes is difficult because it doesn't make many mistakes. Um, we did find two, and I've used examples here where um, they did, it did make mistakes. So in this one, in the original, it said students should be encouraged to use, to, to, to use machine translation and ChatGPT had changed it to students are encouraged. So I said to them, you know, it's slight, but that is a bit of a change in meaning. Um, this one uh, had referred to castes and ChatGPT had changed it to cultures. So I asked the students, is that the same thing? And they said, no. So, you know, they know they have to read it carefully to make sure it's saying what they intend it to say. Um, and there's just one more example. Uh, my second example, is the learning outcome was to examine word structure to infer meaning. So I gave them a table of related academic English words and it was language related. So I had bilingual, monolingual, monoglot, translanguaging, translation. So they had similar structural things um, for them to look at. And then um, this is something I did with ChatGPT, but the students could do it as well. And um, I asked ChatGPT to make a table of those words in English and then translate it into all the languages of the students in the class so we could compare them. And so I'll show you, and it took ChatGPT about 30 seconds to do this. And that's the, the, the table we got. So then I could put this on the board and kind of validate their languages as well. And I could show them that just by looking at their languages, especially like in Nepali, I could look at the structure without knowing any Nepali and I could work out which of parts of that means language from their, um, from their language. And they could do it with the other ones as well. Um, so we went through them and had a look. 
An interesting one here actually is the Edo Bini translation. I've put approximate because when we were doing the machine translation, the Google Translate task, there's one student, Nigerian student, who speaks this, I think, minority um, language in Nigeria. And it's not available on Google Translate. So he was a bit frustrated. He couldn't do it. So I said, okay, well, let's try ChatGPT then. We did that. Um, in, asked ChatGPT to translate what he'd written into Edo, into Bini, and it did it. And I said to him, is it, is it accurate? I thought maybe it's minority language, it won't be. And he said, yeah. And he said, this is accurate. So again, that was uh, increasing the accessibility. Uh, one more example. Um, the learning outcome here was to use the academic word list um, and learn vocabulary actively and independently. So I wanted to teach them a way that because um, we don't have time in class to learn it all, to be able to go home and learn it themselves. So I presented students with the academic word list, described, told them what it was. They underlined words that they didn't know. Um, and then they selected three they wanted to learn. I then gave students a prompt to create their own quiz using a Gen AA chatbot. And this was because there are some um, sort of online tools to use to learn the AWL. They're all quite old and clunky and I, I couldn't find one that worked very well. And so this is what I gave them. We used perplexity because they didn't need to sign into it. Um, and this is the prompt. You are an EAP tutor. Create a multiple choice quiz to help me learn the definitions of the following words. They would add their words in. Ask me one question at a time and give me feedback and an example sentence using the word after each answer. And then it would do that. It would create a multiple choice quiz so they could, you know, they were using gener generative AI in a way that was productive and to, to help them learn. Um, and okay, so that's uh, the the end of uh, the talking bit of the, um, and I think we do have time actually for the interactive task, maybe like 10 minutes or so. I had thought, because I've been using the learning outcomes here um, uh, to show how uh, I would think of a way to include like their languages and generative AI in a way that was productive. And I thought maybe um, the people listening could um, suggest some learning outcomes and I would have a look at them and um, explain how I might approach that um, with this approach and what I might uh, what I might do. So hopefully the Menti slide will work if people want to write down a learning outcome and we'll see what we get. Hang on, let me just turn off my uh, pen here in case that gets in the way. So let's see if that's going to work. It's a QR code. Or um, there is, you can go to menti.com and put the code in, which is 86490929. And we'll see what comes up. Okay, so practicing developing an academic argument. Um, I have used it in class recently for um, debates. So um, because generative AI are chatbots, you're using natural language to interact with it, and they generally use a standard English um, in their responses. Um, I have done that this where we um, uh, organized debates. So the debate was, you know, it's this um, CLA I've been doing, is academic English um, necessary for and against? And they organized, they'd uh, come up with their arguments and um, wrote them down. And then they had a debate between each other. We had some, you know, we developed some functional language as well. Um, and then I put um, ChatGPT on the screen and we did the same thing with ChatGPT. Um, so they would give an argument. We told it which side it was for or against. And then they would give their argument, I would type it in, and then ChatGPT would give a response. Usually the responses are kind of a bit too long and too complex, but then I could show them, you can tell it what to do. You can say to it, I don't understand. Can you simplify that? Or could you use shorter answers? Um, and so, you know, they can practice um, uh, their argumentation skills like, like that. Um, 
they can also just ask it for uh, feedback. So uh, just yesterday, I did a kind of experimental uh, class where I was using um, a worksheet with some steps of how to interact with a chatbot to develop their thesis statements. So they, I gave them the essay question, they come up with a very short response and wrote it down. And then I gave them a kind of a couple of prompts to choose from. And I the prompt said to the to the chatbot, um, guide Mark, ask me questions and guide me, but never give me the answer. And so they would have a conversation. The um the 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 chatbot would ask them questions to develop, you know, what's the topic that you're talking about? Okay, so what are your ideas on this? What are your views on the topic? <laughs> Sorry. Um summarize academic texts. Yeah, using it for that. So my students, their last assessment was um, watching a video and then summarizing it. They had to do that in exam conditions. So no digital tools for that. They had to do it themselves. But they only get a few chances to practice in class. But I told them, if you open up the Edge browser, Microsoft Edge, we're on the Microsoft suite, and then you open up Copilot within the Edge browser and you open it up next to a YouTube video, it connects with that web page. So they can watch the video, write their own summary, and then um, they can ask Copilot to summarize the video that's open and it will do it. And then they can put their own summary in there and say, can you evaluate my summary? How did I do copy and paste their summary? And it will give them feedback on that. Or they can watch the video if they're just doing the first step main points, watch the video, write down what they think are the main points and then ask um, Microsoft Copilot, what are the main points of this video and compare um, if, uh, if they got the same things. So they can, you know, use it productively at home, independent learning. We'll do, what have we got? Maybe a few more minutes. Um, synthesizing information from different sources. Yeah, I haven't addressed that yet in classes, but it's something that I, I find difficult to address in the way that, um, maybe you could use it for exemplars for this because now there are um, research tools for AI, consensus.ai. If you go to consensus and you put in a research question, it'll give you an answer and it will synthesize all of the research and link to the research in its answer and will basically do that for you. So I haven't done this, but you could take one of those um, synthesized paragraphs it gives you of the research and give it to the students to show them and they could notice how the information is um is synthesized into the paragraph as an example. So that could be something that you could do. Like I said, endless exemplars. If the AI can do this, um, it doesn't mean then they don't have to, but it does mean that they can see how it's done. Um, and they also still need tutor guidance to know what they're looking out for, what they should be noticing and what they should be evaluating. Um, Developing engaging presentation skills in their delivery specifically. There is, I don't know if you were aware that Microsoft PowerPoint is already um, already has a uh, rehearsal coach inbuilt into it. Um, it. It doesn't, it kind of, it's kind of a little bit annoying. It will kind of interrupt you and say, stop saying um and ah. And I tell the students to ignore that because saying um and ah is fine. Um, but it will give you some feedback on your um, tone um, and the speed of your delivery as well. Uh, so Microsoft PowerPoint has had that for a while now. So that's some AI that's already been around. Um, I think speaking uh, ones are going to come up um, more uh, frequently. Uh, they probably use more com computational power to do. Um, so there's not as many as I thought there would be at this point. But I don't think it'll be long before there are um, really good uh, uh, speech recognition kind of you know coaches uh, that are AI to do this and they can practice at home. And the other benefit is that they don't kind of have to be embarrassed. They, um, uh, they're not being judged by someone. It's just a computer. And I think that I've read research recently on students showing that the, the, their willingness to communicate, um, increases a lot when they're, um, communicating with, a, with gen AI, because, you know, they don't have to be embarrassed about it. They don't have to be shy. Um, where are we? Identify common elements of academic style in journal articles about your subject. I have done, I've done this sort of thing. I think I more like to get the students to do this themselves without the AI. Um, but there are a lot of, um, you know, they all will, almost all of the um, Gen AI now will take uploads of um, PDFs. Um, and so 
I haven't tried it, but you could upload one and just ask it that, you know, what are the elements of, uh, you could also upload two from, um, you know, different ones and ask it, what are the um, elements of academic um, style or, yeah, you can see what you get from it. Um, share your findings in a six minute group presentation um, using uh, speech to text in things even like word dictate. Um, so they are speaking, but then they get a record, a written record of what they've said. Um, and then they can uh, put that written record into some sort of chatbot and say, how can I improve this? Um, how can I be more concise? Uh, what language would you recommend? You know, they're, they're, they're okay with that sort of thing. Um, the problem there is accessibility. If the if the machine if the speech to text isn't trained on their particular accent, it might not work terribly well. But word, depending on what students you um, teach, I do notice that um, word dictate does have. You can select English Indian, so there are different types of English. It does have English Indian in there. So there are signs that um, uh, the AI is just starting to be a bit more diverse. Um, and I think, again, the technology is developing. It's um, the worst it will ever be at the moment. And I have tested um, the thing that made me pay for ChatGPT eventually was when they brought up, I tried the, the, the speech to text on it. And I tried, I thought, I wonder if it works in Welsh. It's my second language. And, I, and it's a minority language. It's not very um, well represented in technology. So I tried it and it understood fairly well. Made, made some mistakes, but I was surprised. But that wasn't what impressed me. What impressed me was... Um, I thought, well, what if I code switch? Because I code switched quite a lot. And I did. I spoke Welsh and I code switched into English and it understood it. And I was just blown away by that, that it could do that. Um, synthesize three sources into a single paragraph. That's the kind of text manipulation and writing uh, manipulation that AI is quite good at. If you give it something to work with. So if you ask Gen AI just um, uh, blank to create something like it, it it's not that's not the, the best way to use it it'll then it'll hallucinate it'll make things up but if you give it written text to work with it works um, uh, better so you could ask it get the students to learn themselves how to do that but then teach them to notice like what has it done give them a worksheet to kind of see maybe you could give them a worksheet to say what has it removed what has it kept how has it made it cohesive that sort of thing um i think we'll stop there and have time for our um, question and answer. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Oops, I pressed the wrong button. Thanks, Kelly. That was great. Is my I've just switched mics. Can I just check? Can you still hear me? All right. Yeah, I can hear. You. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That was really, really great. Um, we just have a quick chat before the um, before this kicked off. We're going to um, turn off the recording now before we get to questions. Um, so uh, the reason being, everyone can be free to take the mic and. Um, not worry about being permanently recorded on YouTube. So at this point, I'm just going to say thanks again, again to Kelly um, for a really great presentation and farewell to our YouTube viewers.